Hey, good evening. Welcome back to another week here at Bible Study Fellowship. We are going to be looking at the second part of the book of Jeremiah. Let me pray for us and we will jump right into our passage. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we have the opportunity to investigate your word with the assistance of your Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that you would reveal to us the truths that you spoke to your people uh, through the prophet Jeremiah. Lord, you didn't write this passage to us, but you definitely wrote it for your people. Uh, You wanted us to know about the covenants, the seriousness that you approach covenants with, as well as the new covenant. And so, Father, I ask that you would reveal to us what we need to learn from this book uh, and help help us to apply it to our lives today. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm wondering if you've ever had a time in your life when you knew that you were going to get something new. Maybe you were going to get a new phone or a new shirt or a new car or a new pen. Uh, Whatever it might have been, there does tend to be something exciting about knowing that something new is coming. Um, I don't know if it's the anticipation. I don't know if it's, you know, thinking about what is it going to be like to have this new pen that I'll be able to write with and it'll be wonderful and it won't hurt my hand anymore or whatever it is. Uh, Things that are new tend to have a sense of excitement and anticipation for us. And I think as we come to the book of Jeremiah, part of what makes this book exciting is uh, there is something new in it. Many of the books that we've looked at so far in our study of BSF have talked about the Old Covenant. We've heard uh, about how God established it with a great judgment on the people of Egypt and a great deliverance uh, for the people of Israel. The the events of the Exodus, the plagues, uh, the time in the desert with manna and quail, God delivering the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. We've, we've sort of heard about that many times, and Jeremiah is no different than the other prophet. He definitely talks and mentions and points back to this great event in Israel's history where God established himself as the God of the nation. But Jeremiah begins to also talk about, through the words that he hears from God, the words that God gave him about a new covenant, one that will be different from the old one. And so we're going to take a look at the book of Jeremiah uh, in our discussion this week and in our lesson uh, and try to understand more about this new covenant that God wants to establish with his people. And I think that's our main truth for this lesson is that God will establish and he is establishing a new covenant with his people. Go ahead and uh, take a look at the book of Jeremiah. We're going to be moving through it a little bit. I'm going to be following uh, there, there's many paths that you could journey through in this book. It's a, it's a, it's a masterful book. There's story, there's poetry, there's prophecy inside of this book. And so we're going to kind of walk down one road of this book and we're going to look at the old covenant, the covenant that was broken by the people of Israel. We're going to look at God's perspective about that broken covenant and some of the consequences that come with it. And then we're also going to take a look at the new covenant. There's many other roads that we could walk in the book of Jeremiah, but this week we're going to look uh, at, at that one. I've talked a little bit this, this evening about the old covenant, the one that existed. It's often referred to uh, in theology books or other places as the Mosaic Covenant. But we know that, that uh, from the study of the Bible and the study of the book of Exodus and the book of Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that this old covenant was established as God broke the yoke of slavery that the people of Israel were experiencing in Egypt, and he established a new covenant relationship with them at Mount Sinai. Uh, one, of the, one of the phrases that's throughout the first five books of the Bible is this idea that you, Israel, will be my people, and I will be your God. Uh, if we look at uh, some of the requirements of the Old Covenant, the, the, the ones that stand out most notably would be the Ten Commandments, uh, the Ten Words, the things that God wanted his people to do to adhere to uh, the covenant, some of the, the, the regulations and the things that they were supposed to do, the way that they were supposed to be in relationship with God was, was going to be born out as they began to understand and take the Ten Commandments to heart. And right away, Exodus 20, verses 3 and 4, the very first thing that God says is that as a part of this covenantal relationship, you'll have no other gods before me. 
And then the, the, the second commandment is uh, you should not make for yourselves a carved image. You should not bow down or serve them. And so as we, as we think about you know, some of the very first things that God was focused on is that as his people were having a relationship with him, they could not be bringing other gods into this relationship that they would be bowing down to and that they would be worshiping. And I think it's, you know, even, even in some of the words that I might have just used, uh, we can try to boil down the Ten Commandments to be a list of things that we're supposed to do and the things that we're supposed to not do. Uh, and, and that was an easy, te- it's an easy tendency for us to make as, as God's followers today. And it's something that, that was easy for the nation of Israel to do, to just think about, there's a list of things that I have to check off on a box. And one of those things is I'm not going to have any other gods uh, before the God of the Bible. But we know that uh, the people of Israel had definitely uh, introduced idol worship into their their practice. It definitely happened in the northern kingdom with the establishment of the golden calves uh, that were established at the cities of Bethel and the city of Dan. And, and we've seen many other times where there is idol worship and Baal worship that was happening, not only in the land of Israel, but also in the land of Judah. Uh, and the problem was, is that the people had forgotten God. If we look at Jeremiah 2, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 13, God says through Jeremiah, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. God was specifically speaking to the people about their worship of idols. God even looked at the nations around the people of Israel uh, chapter 2, verse 11, has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. So God was pointing out Moab and Ammon and the Philistines, they had their gods and they, they were faithful to worship them. They were false gods. They were idolatrous gods. But the nation of Israel had set aside the one true God and had begun idol worship. And we saw that through the book of Kings. And we've seen that message of idolatry repeated again and again in the book of the prophets. The thing that uh, has been so interesting or was interesting in this book was the graphic depiction of what idolatry feels like to God. Uh, This happens in chapter 3, but in many other places as well. Uh, Chapter 3, verse 6, God really holds up the idolatry of the people of Israel and Judah as not just adultery, not just an adulterous marriage relationship, but a, 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 a prostitution type of relationship where the people of Israel have not just gone and had one relationship with one uh, person as in an adulterous way, but many, many times the people have done this again and again and again. To the point that God essentially says, you're like a sex worker. You've, you've done this so often and so frequently, so often and so willingly, you have gone and pursued other gods. It's as in a marriage relationship, it's as if, if one of the people was a prostitute. And that sort of was the point, uh, if you think back to the story of Hosea and Gomer, where Gomer was living as Hosea's wife, but acting as a prostitute, God says that is the metaphor, that what it is like in this relationship that we're in. Uh, it is an adulterous relationship. Other, other metaphors are present throughout the, uh, the book of Jeremiah to help the people understand. It talks about the failed vineyard uh, and you know, other, other ways that God has made clear that his people have, uh, have ultimately failed him. One of the things we also see Jeremiah doing, we'll see him do this a few times as you as you read through the later chapters, Jeremiah goes and he enacts some parables. And so one of the ways that God is making the point about what is this adulterous, idolatrous relationship like, he has uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 11, he sends Jeremiah to the Euphrates River to bury a loincloth, essentially some undergarments that they wore in the first century. Uh, you can read about it there, but he, he, sends, he sends Jeremiah there. He has him bury the loincloth in the cleft of a rock or hide it in a cleft of a rock. And at some point later, many days later, uh, 13 verse 6, uh, arise, go to the Euphrates, find the loincloth. And so Jeremiah digs it up and behold, 
the loincloth was spoiled and good for nothing. And God goes on to explain uh, that that this uh, loincloth, this it's a it's a picture of what idolatry had done to the people of Israel. Uh, it, it God explains the parable, thus saith the Lord, even so I will spoil the pride of Judah the Great, the pride of Jerusalem, this evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be like this loincloth, which is good for nothing. Uh, God goes on to explain, verses 11, for the loincloth clings to the waist of the man. So I made the house of Israel and the whole house of Judah to cling to me, declares the Lord that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory, but they would not listen. And so we see these enacted parables that happen uh, throughout the book of Jeremiah as God is seeking to explain to the nation what their rebellion, what their adultery, what their idol worship looks like. Uh, Jeremiah uh, 11.3 reminds us that there are consequences for disobeying the covenantal relationship, the covenantal law that God had established. Cursed be the man who does not hear the words of this covenant that I commanded to your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. That's Jeremiah 11.3. The principle for this first section is that God desires relationship, not merely external behaviors from his people. God desires relationship and not merely external behaviors from his people. Alan Jackson and Jimmy Buffett wrote a song together in 2003 called It's Five O'Clock Somewhere. And the idea of this song is that I work for my employer from nine to five. My employer doesn't want me to consume alcohol while I'm on the clock with them. But at five o'clock, my commitment to my employer ends. Now, the, the nuance of this song is that You know, Alan and Jimmy were at a bar maybe around noon, and their point was, well, it's five o'clock somewhere. And so, again, they were looking for some way to transactionally fulfill their obligation to their employer and still ultimately do what they want to do. Uh, But I think that in some ways we can look at the relationship that we have with God, and we want to make it more like the transactional relationships that we have with you know, Amazon or our employer or our bank, uh, whatever. We have a lot of transactional relationships where we do something and we expect Amazon or our employer to do something. We have an obligation to our employer. And as soon as we've fulfilled it, we're done. We're off the hook. It's five o'clock somewhere. And I think that we can tend to take that perspective and begin to apply it to God. God, my commitment to you goes as far as going to church on Sunday morning and BSF or whatever. We sort of set parameters on it. And then Lord, the rest of the week, it's my time. It's for me to do what I want. Uh, Perhaps you've set up in your life that you have a quitting time with God. When it gets to be a certain time of the day, I'm done. Whatever I might've been doing to spend time with the Lord, to learn about him, to study the Bible, I'm done with that. And now I'm on to me time. Time for me to do what I want because somewhere it's five o'clock. Well, God wanted the people of, of Israel to know, the people of Judah to know, that there would be consequences for disobeying, uh, for violating the covenantal terms. Now, if you're wondering, like, where it, you, we've sort of read some of these things that, that God is saying are going to happen to the nation as they begin to violate the covenant, and you might say to yourself, like, man, God is just coming up with this crazy stuff out of nowhere and he just seems really angry why is god so angry with his people that he's saying things that that feel so violent and 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 mean uh, towards the people uh well really what this was is that as the covenant was established in the book of deuteronomy and in the in the you know the first part of the of the bible that we read about there were blessings and curses that people would experience for following the covenant and or disobeying the covenant. So if you look at Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 44, it's a whole section of curses that the people will experience for violating the terms of the covenant. If you read that section, I don't have time to go through it right now, but if you read that, you're going to see the echoes of that in Jeremiah and the other prophets. God is not just, you know, really angry with the people and snapping his fingers and saying, you're going to be food for the birds. 
He, he's not doing that. These were things that were spelled out in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28, 26. And your dead body shall be food for the birds of the air. And, and again, as Jeremiah has been given the task of communicating this to the people, he is going to enact some parables to help the people understand what this looks like. The Lord said to Jeremiah, chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. So Jeremiah is going to be a single man. He's going to be a single person without a family. Why is that? Why is it that God didn't want Jeremiah to have a wife or to have children? Well, God had a point that he wanted to make. Uh, And this is what God said to Jeremiah in that section. This is 16 verse 3. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place and concerning the mothers who bore them and the fathers who fathered them in this land, they shall die of deadly diseases. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried. They shall be as dung on the surface of the ground. They shall perish by the sword and by famine, and their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. So what God is basically saying through Jeremiah is that, hey, the things that I said would be punishments, curses. When we establish the Mosaic Covenant, those things are going to come to pass. In the same way that the blessings happened, uh, the, the curses of the covenant were going to come to pass. These are things that were part of the covenantal agreement that, that the nation of Israel entered into with God. Uh, one of the things that the Bible reveals to us is that the Mosaic covenant was good. It was a good covenant. God was faithful to keep his part of the covenant. The people of Israel were not. And it wasn't so much that Israel tried really, 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 really hard and God got them on some technicality. Aha! You didn't do this one thing. Uh, That wasn't it. Remember, the metaphor is, is not just accidental adultery, but it was repeated, willful, again and again and again. The people rejected God. They rejected his covenant Uh, And the reality is, is that the principle for this section is that God will not alter his covenant. God will not alter his covenant. You and I have uh, probably made many files on computer systems. Maybe you use Windows or Mac OS and you make a document and you can go look at it and you can see when was that document created? When was that document last modified? You can also, maybe if you use something like Google Drive or Microsoft Teams, you can have multiple folks that are working in a document at the same time. And you can see, you know, so-and-so made changes a minute ago and you made a change 20 minutes ago. Uh, When God goes and looks at the covenants on his hard drive and realize he has no hard drive, but when God creates covenants, there's just a create date. It doesn't change. He doesn't edit it. He doesn't modify it. And sometimes I think that God's people were hoping that there'd be an amendment, that there'd be a modification. Well, you know, God, we we're, we still love you. We still think you're great. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, we had some problems over here. But at the core of it, we were committed to you. Or, you know, it was really hard, God. It was really hard what you asked us to do. Maybe you can change that up for us. Maybe you can make it a little bit different so that we don't have to, we can keep experience the blessings Maybe not some of those curses that are out there. How are you and I hoping that God will amend his covenant to make an accommodation for us and for our sin? Um, and, And similarly, you know, how does the fact that God is very consistent provide comfort or concern uh, to you and to me? Well, as I mentioned, Jeremiah began to speak to the people about a new covenant, and a lot of this happens, uh, again, throughout Jeremiah, but maybe most noticeably in Jeremiah 31, uh, 31, 1 through, I think it's actually someplace else. I'm going to find where it is. Jeremiah 30, it is 31, but it's 31. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 is where Jeremiah begins to talk about the new covenant. Uh, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, 
though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So some chief differences between the old covenant and the new covenant. One, the the law will be within the people and it will be written on their hearts. Two, all people will know the Lord. All people will know the Lord. And then the third element of this covenant that Jeremiah reveals to us is that God will forgive the iniquity of the people and remember their sins no more. One of the ways that this new covenant is enacted by Jeremiah is uh, Jeremiah buys a field in Jeremiah 32. Uh, It happens, uh, it's in a broader section there, but Jeremiah buys a field in Jeremiah 32. It's during the siege. The city of Jerusalem is under siege. The armies are encamped around the city, and someone comes to Jeremiah with a great offer on some land. You'd think that during a siege, during a war, when your kingdom is about to be overthrown, and you know it's going to be overthrown because God's told you it's going to be overthrown, not a good time to make a land investment. But the Lord had come to Jeremiah and had said, Jeremiah, this is, I want you to do this. This is part of my enacted parable is for you to buy this land. And so uh, Jeremiah 32, uh, chapter 32, verse 9, I bought the field that Anathoth from Hanamel, my cousin, and weighed out the money to him. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, weighed the money on the scales. I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and the conditions and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to the bank. And ultimately, uh, Jeremiah said to uh, Baruch, uh, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds the sealed deed and the open deed, put them in the earthenware vessel that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. There was a promise of the people coming back to the land. There was a promise that a new covenant was coming. Um, and I, I think that as we begin to understand that and as the Bible begins to help us understand as we get into the New Testament uh, and we hear Jesus talking about the new covenant, we begin to understand that God is ushering in a new covenant uh, for his people. One of the complicated aspects is that this new covenant doesn't mean that the Mosaic covenant is going to get thrown away or discarded or is isn't going to be important. Um, but uh, Jesus has ultimately fulfilled the requirements of the Mosaic Covenant, and uh, the principle for this section is that God alone will be responsible for keeping the terms of the New Covenant. God alone will keep the terms of the New Covenant. Uh, The county that I live in requires me to have a signed property tax receipt whenever I want to go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and get my license renewed or get a new license plate for my car, Uh, And so as a result, I am always looking for that receipt. You got to find it. You you can't do anything at the Department of Motor Vehicles without it. And it did seem like the people of Israel lost track of God's law on numerous occasions. I I think it was a little bit bigger than the personal property tax receipt, God's law, more scrolls. I just have like a quarter sheet of paper. Uh, But regardless, during the time of Hezekiah and the time of Josiah, they found the book of the law. And they read it, and they interpreted it, and they began to live it out. And other times, they were like, where's the book of the law? Is there a book of the law? They lost it. They didn't know where it was. Um, And so they were unable to, even if they had wanted to, they didn't have the book of the law. They couldn't follow it. And God's point is is that the new covenant is going to be different. The new covenant is going to be written on people's hearts. You will know it. You won't lose it. You won't wonder, am I following the law? Am I not following the law? God will make it clear. God will make it clear what it is to live the new covenant. I think one question we want to ask ourselves is, does your heart belong to God? Uh, The idea of a covenant is that we are going to be in relationship with God. God has a law that he wants to write on the people's hearts, but he's going to write it on hearts that wholly belong to him. And so who does your heart belong to? 
Who does your heart belong to? And then I think one of the open questions that Jeremiah leaves for us is what more does the Bible teach us? What have you learned? What do you want to learn about the new covenant that Jeremiah has begun to teach us about? Well, I'll leave you with this final thought as we wrap up. Uh, Jesus makes all things new. Uh, The new covenant, if you want to understand what is the new covenant going to look like, what is it going to be like, how do I get some of that new covenant for my life, look to Jesus because Jesus is the one who will establish and see that the new covenant is fulfilled for those who have a relationship with him. Let me pray for us and uh, we'll wrap up. Lord, thank you for your son. Thank you for the promise of the new covenant. I pray that you would continue to help us learn more about how you interact with your people through covenantal relationships and help us to understand how we can have a relationship with Jesus that will that will help us to understand how these words can be written on our hearts. Pray this in his name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week.